speaking with CleanSpark, which is our top pick for 2024 and has been our top pick since the beginning of 2023. We're joined by Matt Schultz, the executive chairman of CleanSpark. Matt, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us today. Always great to be here, Brian. Thanks for including me. Yeah, of course. Um, so let's jump right into it and let's talk about the halving, which is, which is quickly coming upon us. Uh, so this is the first time that we've seen Bitcoin reach new highs ahead of a halving. And as a result, the industry views on, on, on what's going to happen post halving have been rapidly evolving. So with ETFs generating significant buying pressure uh, and public interest growing for Bitcoin, what, what, what's your expectation for hash rate? Uh, call it post having because prior to this we had been thinking declines of thirty percent or more, and and we brought those estimates you know, much much further south to call it fifteen percent. Would be really interested to hear your view. You know, I think you nailed it. I think you know, in in from our perspective, we think it's it's lower than what we talked about, but somewhere in that twenty five percent range, um, potentially a bit lower. But you know, it's 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 really a function of um, a multitude of different factors. You know, you and I have spoken before and earlier in my career, I was, you know, in traditional energy space and the variables are, you know, what's the price of a barrel of oil or a billion cubic feet of gas? And then what are the, what are the drilling uh, exploration production costs? And those are pretty much fixed. But with, with the Bitcoin mining space, there are so many variables and it's so difficult to kind of nail down what's going to drive it, where it's going to go um, and, and actually what the efficiency of the global network looks like. So, we think that you know, with the the new massive orders of S twenty ones and T twenty ones and M sixties and um, you know more efficient machines, we believe that you know vertically integrated miners can now get more hash rate out of the same slots. So rather than the thirty to forty percent um, decrease in hash rate, you know it's it's we're, our, our estimates are in that twenty to thirty percent range, maybe as low as fifteen. Um, it's possible also that a lot of that hash rate comes back online. Now, there are still a tremendous number of Bitcoin miners that have fleet efficiencies well over 30 joules per terahash. So that becomes existential unless the price goes significantly higher than what it is currently. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that viewpoint. Um, you know, and, and I guess as you're, as you're thinking about the broader mining pool, what percentage of that is public miners? And 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 certainly we're hearing about nation states getting involved with, with crypto mining. You know, have you have you heard um have you heard comments on that just in your circles? Yeah, uh, you know, you hear about the United Arab Emirates and Bhutan and 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 nation states such as those that are are more involved. Um it it's a pretty specialized space. Um it, it's challenging and, and, you know, the real threat are, I think our biggest concern are places where there is surplus energy that nation states can access at little or no cost. Um, right. We haven't seen the, a big impact, you know, I think probably consistent with what you're hearing. Um, we're seeing a lot of discussion in Ethiopia about the government getting involved in partnership with some other miners to to you know further develop that infrastructure they see it as a tool to expand their utility grid and have you know abundant clean energy so you know i think there is some risk i think what we're we're seeing and what you're probably going to continue to see is partnerships between bitcoin miners and utilities where they work together and the the bitcoin mining company becomes a shock absorber for the utility and it's it i wouldn't necessarily predict a consolidation of those those ventures yet but i think you're going to see a much more synergistic approach um that that the the utilities use bitcoin miners as a tool yeah i think that's a really good point because the the, the miners have the ability to absorb excess capacity but also to curtail in periods of, uh, of peak demand um so so as you're thinking about the broader mining industry how do you see it evolving over the next call it three to five years so you know obviously difficulty is kind of a, a, a mystery at this point right so the having's coming up supply is being cut in half demand is at an all-time high you know i had the 
good fortune of of having a a really in depth conversation with uh, Leah Wald, and Leah ran the um, WGMI ETF, which is the the Bitcoin miner ETF. But then her firm Valkyrie also launched some Bitcoin spot ETFs, and she was kind enough to share with us that there there are daily settlement challenges for these Bitcoin ETFs that effectively when the when the U.S. equity markets close, that there becomes a, an auction or a bidding war to fill all of the orders of the Bitcoin. So I think, you know, with the volatility of the GBTC liquidations and the additions of, of the um, ETFs, there's still a lot of mystery. But, but what I can tell you is we think adoption is a fraction of where it's going to be. And as a result, we think demand is going to go parabolic which obviously is going to drive price. There's a limited number of liquidations that the GBTC can continue to make as a result of their fee structure. And then it becomes normal market dynamics of supply and demand. So I think, you know, where we go going forward is, I, I honestly believe, and, and, you know, Zach and I have been part of conversations um, over the last weeks and months with, with a lot of other um, large publicly traded companies. And, and I think the consensus is consolidation is inevitable. Um, you're seeing a shift in a lot of the business practices of a lot of miners. And what is being rewarded both by the research the, the, the research arm, such as you guys uh, and other companies, but also from institutional investments and now retail is being driven to follow, and that is efficiency of operations. So it doesn't matter how much hash rate capacity you have. I think what really becomes a factor is how efficiently you can operate, because as this becomes a more industrialized space, um, efficiency matters. Um, you can no longer get by with plugging in inefficient machines and having, you know, your 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 realized hash rate lower than um, than than what it should be and, and be operating at anything less than 98 or 99 percent uptime. So I think. You'll see in, in three to five years, I think you're going to see a lot of consolidation. I wouldn't be surprised if the public mining pool that, you know, now is what, 18 or 20 companies, I think that probably shrinks down to less than a half dozen. Um, you know, there's obviously been a huge pivot. You know, Marathon is the 900 pound gorilla in the room and and forever Merrick. And then after Merrick, subsequently Fred. Um, you know, they've, they've always been advocating for the asset light model that owning miners is the most important and the infrastructure doesn't matter. And we've seen that that's, that's become a complete 180. You know, now they're aggressively buying facilities that they've previously hosted in and looking for other infrastructure because, you know, quite frankly, you can't control what you don't own. And, and so I, I don't think that a hosted mining solution is likely to continue going forward. Um, I think miners that are hosted are, are probably a thing of the past within the next year or two. Um, vertical integration, self-mining is going to be the only way. And that's really driven strongly by energy relationships and energy contracts. It's going to become an increasing component of the business. No more can you go in through the back door and, and sign a, 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 a deal where you're getting some surplus power or you know a unique sweetheart demand response uh, package, and and not have that um, have political implications. The the benefit of working with the utilities has been really evident strongly by what we've done. I mean, you've seen the TV state that WBC TV in Atlanta talking about how you know Clean Sparks participation in these small communities is driving down utility rates, and the the sales tax that we pay is actually driving down property taxes in some of those jurisdictions. And I think unless the miner can offer benefits to the community, to the utility, to the surrounding jurisdictions, there, there's really no need for them. There's, there's no, they're not welcome there. So, you know, a hosted facility is, is probably less likely to survive. Um, and, and miners are going to really need to be community oriented and, and be in alignment with public policy to make sure that we're supporting and growing this industry responsibly. Yeah, we, I, I think we agree with that from a from a research point of view. Certainly, you've been our top pick in, in in mining because of your focus on efficiency. And there's at least in our view going to be ample opportunity for consolidation moving forward. Um, I guess as you're as you're thinking about you know potential consolidation, potential M and A, um, 
that's, I guess, one thing that'll come from the having. But the other is your your very impressive growth outlook for Exahash. I guess, how do you plan on getting there, and, and how do you plan on securing the the rigs that you'll need? You know, we um, I, I think our terms, our contract with Bitmain is among the most favorable. Um, you know, we secured. 4.4 exahash of S21s last summer at $14 a terahash. And then we we did, you know, 60,000 machines and another 100,000 machines at around $16 a terahash. And the reason we did that is last time the the bull market really took off, machines became a commodity that were that that was the biggest variable, you know. Marathon and Riot ordered a billion dollars worth of XPs and they were paying in the 80 to $100 per terahash range. You know that that market has now settled down, and as I mentioned, we're buying more efficient machines that are are much less temperature sensitive um, for a fraction of the value. So, by securing the 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 right machines for growth and understanding that you know we took pre delivery of some of those machines, and Taylor and Tyler and Bradley on my team took the time to work on the firmware and the software to understand how far can we push these machines? How much can we underclock them? How much can we increase efficiency? How much can we increase output on the inverse side of the equation? So, you know, we we wanted to have the, the predictability of the right type of machines. But then with us, as you know, it's all about infrastructure and the clean spark way. So we, you know, we've announced our expansion into Mississippi. Um, we talked about our expansion in Dalton. We talked about some stranded megawatts at our existing facilities that give us the ability to continue to grow. But also, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the ability to get more hash power out of out of a single slot based on the new machines is also, you know, a, a, a factor that really doesn't get cons as enough consideration. So, what I can tell you is, you know, Zach and myself. Gary and the team, we have a weekly M&A call and there are probably two dozen targets on there at any given time, uh, domestically and internationally. Um, and the, the due diligence process starts at, you know, what, what are the sources of energy? What's the availability of that power? Um, what 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 does the the workforce look like? Are these in communities that you know we could make a meaningful impact? Um, and and then it goes to other things, you know, temperature and and uh, elevation and altitude and and policy and you know economic impact and and you know the 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 views of the community or of the state on Bitcoin money. You know, I had a I had somebody call that has a solar farm under development. They have a bunch of surplus megawatts, um, and they ask if we'd be interested in in doing some type of a joint venture happen to be in the state of California. You know, that one word, state of California, not interested. Um, you know, the, the jurisdictions are so challenging. I mean, think about this, Brian. You, you buy a, a half a billion dollars worth of mining machines and you use them at a facility like we have in Georgia where you, you receive those, you pay the proper taxes, you put those to work, and then you move them to a state like California that wants to charge you sales tax yet again on machines you already own and operate. So it becomes cost prohibitive. So we look at states that have the, the surplus power or have the need to continue to develop power are going to have stranded resources. And we feel very confident that based on the impact we've had on the communities that we currently operate in, finding additional megawatts is, is, is pretty simple. In fact, you know, our team spent the last couple of weeks on airplanes going all around the country um, identifying opportunities, both private and public miners that, that may make sense. Um, and quite frankly, you know, the, the public miners that aren't going to survive M and a of, of an existing operation is probably unlikely, but acquisition of infrastructure on a type of an asset purchase is more likely because nobody wants S 17s anymore. Nobody wants the original S 19s. It's, it's really all about maximizing the value of energy. That's right. And as you're as you're thinking about performance within that portfolio, you know, we publish a, you know, call it coin per exahash on, on a monthly basis, and you routinely top the peer group. As you're looking at your fleet of rigs and you're comparing yourself to other miners, what are some of the key performance metrics that you look at look at from an internal basis? So um, right now, I think the last public disclosure we made was that we were at 24.6 joules per terahash across our fleet. Um, 
that I think is, is among the most important, but then the tech stack that we use additionally enables us to overclock or underclock. Everybody talks about overclocking, but the ability to put a machine into a low power mode when temperatures are really high or when energy prices have a, have a spike or when Bitcoin dips, that flexibility I think is key, but something that's really set us apart. And, and that is that we have, we have repair labs on site in our facilities. So, you know, there may be a couple of dozen machines that are surplus machines. So when a hashboard goes bad or when a fan goes bad or a power supply, our teams have the ability to pull those out of the slots, put a replacement machine in, take that directly into the lab, and we can do our own warranty work on site. Our guys are certified to, to do repairs all the way down to the microchip level. And then those go back into the queue. So we routinely see, you know, I have a call every Tuesday morning with Taylor and, and Brad and their team over all the operations and, and, you know, all six or seven or eight of the facilities, their, their team leads are online and they talk about their uptime over the course of the past week. And those numbers are routinely 100%, which is unheard of in this industry. And the only time you see deviation is, we, you know, we had a transformer failure, or we had a power supply unit go bad, or we had a, you know, switch gear that needed to be replaced. So the things that we can control, uptime and the efficiency of our fleet and deployment of capital, I think that's what leads to that, that kind of deviation from the norm as far as Bitcoin per exahash and also exahash per megawatt. You know, there are, there are miners in the space in the top three or four that have, have consistently had substantially higher numbers of machines on their monthly report that don't produce anywhere near the amount of Bitcoin that we have. And, you know, that's that really more than anything is about the people. It's the it's the clean spark way and the processes that we follow that allow us to get that type of execution. Yeah, that's right. You know, this has been a, I, I think, remarkably uh, enlightening conversation for our uh, for our viewers. Um, last question, as we're heading into the having. How do you feel about hodling? You know, um, we take a, a, a unique approach to our hodl and, and we, we kind of develop a thesis based on a number of factors. So back in 21, we, you know, being an energy company and having built products previously in the demand response space, we looked at future pricing models for electricity. And it, it became evident that, you know, Bitcoin was $69,000 in late 21. It was very toppy. Bitcoin's a volatile asset. The ETFs hadn't been approved yet as far as, you know, acceptance as an asset class was still up in the air. But what we did see is there, you know, $2 billion worth of rigs coming in from Marathon and Riot. Core Scientific was mining at an all-time high. So we know difficulty is going to go parabolic. We had a big stack of Bitcoin. What we decided to do is, based on the fact that difficulty was going up, energy prices were going up based on you know the Henry Hub and other pricing models, and, and there's volatility in the price of the underlying commodity, we decided to sell all those coins and, and invest that in some of the immersion technology and the, the different things that you've seen. So late last spring, early summer, um, we started to do some more research about future pricing. We looked at um, what the likelihood of an increase of efficiency of the mining fleets were. And what we realized is, listen, this is between now, last April, and this month is as cheap as we'll ever mine another Bitcoin. So you'll notice from our monthly charts that we've hodled the vast majority of all the Bitcoin that we mined. And we took advantage of the capital markets during the periods of time that the stock was trading crazy. I mean, there were times, you you know this better than I, but there were half a dozen times in the last 90 days that CleanSpark was among the 10 highest volume traded stocks on the NASDAQ. Having the flexibility of a shelf offering and having the ability to go to the market and raise capital when necessary that, that was accretive, um, we took advantage of that. So we built our hodl. So, you know, you saw that last month, I think out of, out of six or 700, whatever the number was that we mined, I don't have it right in front of me, but, but it was 648. I do have it in front of me. Um, I think our, our, our total Bitcoin that we disposed of or that we sold was less than three. Um, and, and so we looked at that with the understanding that we promised to our shareholders that we would use equity only when it was accretive within a couple of fiscal quarters. And so generally that's been by acquiring facilities and 
rigs and infrastructure. But in this case, understanding where all of our internal forecasts, as well as a lot of people much smarter than I am, believe that Bitcoin was going, that it would be accretive to, in fact, stack a little bit of cash, use that shelf registration back when Bitcoin was thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a coin, and our cost is substantially less than that, and invest in keeping all of that Bitcoin and using equity to continue to fund OpEx during that period of time to build what's now, you know, the second or third biggest stack of any of the public miners. So that's that's kind of been our strategy. I think you're going to see our, our continued focus on, on holding more Bitcoin. And I think the reason there, and I apologize for it getting a little bit long-winded, people have invested in miners as a proxy to investing in Bitcoin because there wasn't another option. And now you've got the spot Bitcoin ETFs that are an option, but I think it's going to become an educational process. And, you know, thankfully the work that, that, that you and Greg do does a great deal of education. And that is a spot Bitcoin ETF gives an investor exposure to a Bitcoin at the then spot price. A Bitcoin miner gives an investor exposure to Bitcoin at their cost to mine, which is a third of what that spot price is all in. And but that really only applies if you hold the Bitcoin. You know, Core Scientific has a phenomenal operation, but they don't hold any Bitcoin. So it's not really a proxy for a Bitcoin investment. It's more of an investment in, in, in a miner. So we think it's a delicate balance. We're going to continue to hold Bitcoin. There may be times that we buy Bitcoin um, because we do have a very bullish thesis on the underlying commodity and asset class and really feel like we've just begun to scratch the surface on the adoption and, and utilization of Bitcoin on a global level. Excellent. Well, one of the reasons that we like the stock is that you've been such a strong allocator of capital. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, for running through those topics with us. And we look forward to having you again very soon. Thanks for having me. I look forward to the next time. Great. Thanks.